Can you hear me? So Hi, so I'm Oliver Connelly from the University of Cologne. And I'm happy to share insights today with you on the best treatment options for COVID associated pulmonary aspergillosis and COVID associated mucormycosis. And I'm very happy for the invitation and having the opportunity to share and discuss with my colleagues from the region. And I hope you can hear me because I just had a text message that I should join, but I did join, I'd say. And I need some feedback from somebody, please. Otherwise, I would just go on. So this is my transparency declaration. And um, we are running a lot of clinical trials and designing clinical trials, specifically in the fungal field. Um, publicly or privately funded. So since today I focus not on the hematology population, although we will derive some evidence from there, but focus on the COVID-19 uh, as a new high-risk population, um, I'd like to share with you just some CT scans. That is actually scans from the first five out of 19 patients, the first 19 patients, five of them had aspergillosis and the CT scans looked like this. So um, actually it is not at all instructive. It tells you, yes, COVID or some other virus, but in this case we had proof of Corona and, um, and then they are really sick and ventilated, high pressure, lung is pretty damaged. But then we do find microbiological evidence of the uh, fungal infection, in this case, aspergillosis in all of them. And while we don't necessarily should calculate percentages, if we have just 19 patients, it is 22%. And it is 22% all the way till today, where we had hundreds of patients being ventilated on our ICUs. So, we need more diagnostics to finally diagnose what's going on in these patients. How do we acquire the samples? You just saw when that uh, flap was opened that um, you see the spray of the aerosol and the droplets. Um, this is all full of COVID in this model, okay? And uh, actually this spraying aerosol will go like two, three meters through the room in each direction and, uh, and you will be contaminated unless you really have your protective gear. And since at the beginning we did not have that, people were reluctant to bronchoscope, to bronch these patients. And what happened is that there were a multitude of different types of uh, material. There was one versus um, the individual cutoff values for galactomannan optical density, for example. So it all went pretty um, difficult. And we tried to bring all the evidence on, on one slider and one article. It's freely available on Lancet ID uh, around the uh, end of last year, beginning of this year, this was published. And what you see from left to right is that you do have histology as the gold standard, sure. But I mean, we rarely ever have histological proof in these patients, like in all our other patients. So we must rely more uh, on the probable case and not so much on the proven disease. And probable means microbiological proof in addition to imaging, which is not very instructive because imaging so to say, always looks pretty terrible in these patients. So we do have pulmonary infiltrates and that fulfills already the imaging criteria. But then we do have the microbiology and, and that's a whole shipload of different 
combinations of tests and um, cutoff levels for these tests. So what happens is that we collect these two and um, and um, collect these uh, different sample techniques. And on the right-hand part of the slide, you can see that uh, what these little logos mean and um, the um, the uh, actually what they what they tell us is that we don't have ten different tests. We only have microscopy, serum galactomannan, lateral flow assay, if available at all. We don't have it available, for example, in uh, my hospital. And um, the um, the um, <clears throat> Other ones are culture and then PCR, if available. And of course, the galactomannan test from serum or BAL fluid. So that is more a textbook to look this up, but you should try to find in every patient with um, uh, infiltrate due to corona and on the ventilator. So in every ICU patient, you really should try to identify or exclude aspergillus uh, colonization or aspergillosis. And then the clinical factors are of course uh, always uh, there. And that means that uh, look it up and try to send samples off like three times per week. That is what we do, Monday, Wednesday, Friday or something like that, um, whatever, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, who cares? So every second day in general, you send off a respiratory sample. That does not mean that you bronch them three times per week, but it could be a tracheal aspirate from deep down. There is one particular subsection of disease in kappa, and that's tracheobronchial kappa. That's very interesting because we know that we see that in influenza as well. So tracheobronchial kappa, you can only diagnose bronchoscopically, of course, because you need to well see it and, and then take a sample targeted from exactly that place where you see it. And, um, and if you, without histology, um, prove that there is um, aspergillus in an ulcer, for example, usually that's ulcerous lesions, uh, lesions in an ulcer, you do find aspergillus then, that means even without aspergillosis proof that you have a highly probable and it is a treatment indication for these patients. Um, whenever you recover aspergillus or have a positive test, you need to treat these patients. Even if there's only a possible, I'll come to that. So now that's one uh, moment where I will actually land some evidence from the hematology population because that's where all the clinical trials have been done uh, in a post hoc analysis of the so-called SECURE study, which is the one that compared isoconazole with voriconazole. If you put all the patients, regardless of whether they were treated with ISA or with vori, put them all back into one basket and then you look at them uh, not by the treatment, but by was it a possible invasive mold disease or was it a probable or proven? The latter being the ones where you do have microbiological proof. And uh, what you see is that all cause mortality, that's what ACM stands for here, in that more than 500 patient study, all cause mortality was higher with the proven and probable invasive mold diseases. Uh, and that was the case at day 42, and that was the case at day 84, so six and 12 weeks. Overall success was, of course, reversing that, and overall success was higher than in the possibles than in the proven and probable. So what does that tell us? It tells us that we should treat early. And actually, the drug is licensed for, uh, for that early treatment before you already have your microbiological proof. You can't just sit there and wait for the proof until the lab report comes back and then only start treatment. You as clinicians know that that would increase the uh, death rates in our patients. So 
we should treat early and the possible ones are the earlier ones. And if then no proof comes back, well, you can always decide to stop. And uh, if all your appropriate sampling was done and no aspergillus is found, okay, that's then likely not aspergillus. But uh, you should take that safety margin and, and start early. So starting with what the ESCMID guidelines currently, like all the other guidelines throughout the world, I'm sure you have regional guidelines that say the same, that isoflucronazole and boriconazole are the two A1, the A1 recommendations, while liposomal AMFO is somewhat downgraded to B2 because of the toxicity and because of the lack of a randomized clinical trial in invasive aspergillosis. And then there is a lot of other options, but they are not being actually encouraged. And you can see them on the slide in the lower two thirds of the slide. So if we treat with um, VORI or isoviconazole in the context of hematology, so how, what do we do if uh, we are facing kappa, corona associated pulmonary aspergillosis? And that's, of course, you can treat with voriconazole, you can treat with isoviconazole. Uh, if you do so with VORI on the left-hand side of the slide, then it clearly tells you that you need to do TDM and if you do therapeutic drug monitoring or need this, which is the case with boriconazole always, then you need a rapid turnaround because things change rapidly in these patients. You need to repeatedly test. Quite some go on ECMO. So for which drug we know what the, um, uh, the exposure looks like if the patient is on ECMO. It's not a long list. So uh, we don't want to have drugs in there that are prone to drug-drug interactions. So if we can avoid, we want to avoid. And isoviconazole clearly without TDM necessity. And if you are in a setting of high rates of azole resistance, because usually you get a, um, a, a positive culture from these patients. So that's really, that's a completely different story as compared to hematology, where you only rely on galactomana. But in these, mostly you have a culture, so you can do your susceptibility testing. And if it really tells you that you have a high rate of azole resistance, which basically is the case in the Netherlands and in some other pockets, but um, and some other smaller regions and countries, um, uh, but um, uh, it's not that widespread. So you would usually find one or two percent of resistant. Um, Aspergillus isolates resistant to azoles. So these would require liposome and pterosin B then, but um, that is a, uh, a rare uh, occurrence and we didn't have a single one in our kappa patients. Staying for a moment with that comparison of ISA and boriconazole, survival wise, and that is of course the most uh, interesting and most decisive endpoint, there was no difference in survival between these two. Uh, so you could treat, but this again is hematology, not kappa. So we are just extrapolating to kappa. Um, and then what's on the flip side of the coin, if two drugs are equally as effective, then you want to know how about the safety profile and isoviconazole has clearly quite some advantages. And one important one is safety with much less toxicity to the uh, in blue highlighted organ systems, skin and subcutaneous tissue disorders, eye disorders, and hepatobiliary. So liver function tests, that's an important one. We don't wanna have elevated liver function tests in these patients if we can avoid. And we can avoid because the number needed to harm. So uh, if you would use worry and not isopiconazole, what you get is every 14th patient would have a elevated liver function test where that usually uh, with uh, and specifically with isoviconazole would not be the case, and roughly the same numbers 10 ish around for eye and for the skin toxicity. Well, I'm sorry that this is a little bit of a voriconazole bashing, but the better is always well, if, if, if it's the better drug, isoviconazole, and you have all these all these aspects that. 15 years ago or 20 almost years ago, we were happy to accept pharmacogenetic issues and that we didn't get the exposure with voriconazole that we wanted to have, that it was too high and then toxic or too low and not working. We were still happy because we were comparing this 
with the toxic amphotericin B deoxycholate. And of course, voriconazole is the better choice over, uh, over deoxycholate conventional amphotericin. However, nowadays, we don't accept drugs that we can't really predict and force us into TDM. And TDM is recommended but for Vori, but it's not recommended for isopiconazole because that does not go through CYP2C19 and, um, and does not interfere to the extent that the other azoles do. Um, there is one more peculiar uh, thing with isopiconazole. At first, it was, uh, I guess, that uh, the developers were not happy to see that isopiconazole actually shortens the QTC interval. However, clinically, that's great because we have always three, four, five different drugs in these patients that prolong QTC interval. So if there is one in there that shortens it, that's cool. And um, that might mean that we have a lot less, less issues with, uh, with arrhythmia. And actually just the first 26 patients that we treated, we checked and their um, QTC intervals shortened. This is hematology patients mostly, and they were on multiple drugs and certainly have an issue with uh, prolonged QTC. So this is a Kappa patient um, whom we treated with uh, isobuconazole, and it's at week one and, it, and, and at week three of isobuconazole treatment, so things are improving. Um, these lungs will never again be completely normal as they might have been before patients contracted uh, corona disease. Um, that's what it is. Uh, so I hope everybody uh, gets his corona vaccine instead of uh, gambling and uh, running into severe COVID, developing more than 20% of them kappa, and then having, even if you survive that, a damaged lung for the rest of your life. So all the do's and don'ts of astrogenosis are on these pocket cards. You can scan the QR code and, uh, and it'll bring you to uh, the pocket cards in multiple languages. I just chose English because uh, German or English would be my two choices. And um, so that's the pocket cards that tell you how close you are adhering to the guidelines. Um, if there is an A1 recommendation in the guideline, then it would earn you three score points on this pocket card. And uh, just download it and, and play with it. And uh, I think it's um, interesting and it helps you to um, quickly come to the decisions that are backed by the guidelines. But there is one more topic we need to talk about or briefly address on my last couple of slides, and that is CAM. COVID associated mucormycosis. I don't know whether you uh, receive these patients from uh, Southeast Asia and uh, from India mostly, uh, whether they are, um, uh, whether they come to your hospitals as well. Uh, they certainly do uh, in Germany. And we do see these cases now in Germany and Europe. And, uh, and it's really unusual. Usually it's patients who are um, not that severely sick with COVID. And then later down the road, once they apparently improved, they develop um, uh, mucomycosis. And it's somewhat unclear what the reasons are, but it has to do with overuse of steroids. So not using six milligrams absolute for 10 days, but 10, 20 or whatever number and, or for extended um, uh, periods of time, like the over-the-counter steroids play a role in certain countries. And then multiple other things have been discussed, for example, higher exposure in a, um, in, uh, in a agricultural rural area. What we usually see and that's actually the majority of the CAM patients that we have in Germany is pulmonary involvement. And I'd like just to highlight uh, panel C, top in the middle, where it has that large rim um, and the whole thing is called an inverse or reversed halo sign. And you can see such a sign as well in panel G at the bottom where well, we did three CT scans, that's a leukemic patient and days one, eight and 15. And only on day 15, we understood what was happening that this is a uh, mucomycosis. Um, the patient survived, but um, 
uh, it would have been fantastic to, for the patient to undergo surgery early on before the complete lung was destroyed and his right lung was destroyed and never recovered and then, uh, um, and then he later on underwent surgery. This is what you would rather more frequently see in the context of corona infection, and that is the rhino orbitocerebral mucomycosis with the eye disease that you can see on several of these images. And that is so all the black scars in the nose or, uh, or at the heart palate, that is what you uh, need to look out for in these patients. If that's the case, you need to biopsy. And biopsy would tell you uh, and, uh, that uh, what's going on. So you, you can prove disease, of course, by biopsy. That's what we do in mycology. And if you have rather thin um, septate hyphae, that would be aspergillus in panel C or in panel D as the, um, <clears throat> the uh, two different uh, microscopy uh, techniques using an optical brightener in um, uh, on the right hand side, the blue and black sides, and the mucor mycosis. You would see mucor mycosis in histology because the hyphae are really broad and they are broad bands like an A or super broad like an F. Um, so if they are broad 6 to 16 microns or even broader, 25 in this example in the top left, uh, top right corner then that is proof of mucormycosis. So this is not aspergillus, this is mucor. And completely different treatment until recently, uh, certainly not voriconazole, which is ineffective against uh, mucor. There are only very few drugs you can treat mucor with. Practically, that's isoviconazole and amphotericin B. And there are some data on prosoconazole, but the only study that compared two different drugs is this one with 21 isoduconazole treated patients. They all received treatment first line. And then there are 33 patients matched as a matched control comparison. We very tightly matched them. So they are really resembling the 21. And they were treated with amphotericin B formulations, mostly conventional, the oxycodone amphotericin. That's 33 patients that uh, nicely and, uh, and precisely matched the 21. Um, and matching criteria were, did they undergo surgery? Was there a hematological uh, underlying disease? Did they have disseminated or central nervous system involvement disease? And, uh, and what you see is survival-wise, no difference. That is what led to uh, the approval for mucormycosis in the United States and in Europe. And that's, that's the study. Um, so an overview, if you have all the drugs available, that means liposomal ANFO and isobuconazole and posoconazole, then that's the choices you have. The green ones, it's a traffic light. The green ones are the ones to follow. And this is taken from the guidelines that we published like a week or two weeks before Corona started. So that was really right in time. And that tells us that for invasive aspergillosis, you can treat either with isoconazole or voriconazole. I guess that I expanded on uh, how to properly do it if it's gory with trough levels and uh, TDM. And for invasive mucormycosis, it's somewhat different. You do have liposomal amphotericin as a choice, but you need to dose high or you use isobuconazole dose as above uh, written for invasive aspergillosis. And for muco, we do have another one of these schemes, but if you scan the previous, previous one, then uh, that's the same repository, you will find mucor and other uh, equal scores as well. That helps you to really stick to the guidelines and treat your individual patient closely adhering to the guidelines. If you want to Fill, help fill the basis for quite some recommendations in the guidelines, then you're really welcome to, um, to type individual cases in or drop me an email um, and type individual cases that you might see of rare fungi, mucormycosis, and, and maybe even rare ones um, into the Fungiscope database, which is an online interface. Very easy to do. If you want to hear more about it, 
the guideline, which is gives it like 45 minutes of um, of mucomycosis. Um, you would find that on my YouTube channel, ID in Motion. Or of course, the next interesting meeting after yours um, uh, is the trends in medical mycology in October 8 to 11. It's a hybrid meeting, so super easy to take part and, uh, and learn about fungal infections and certainly a lot about uh, corona and fungal infections. I just saw, saw some interesting late break abstracts today that will be presented. So Tim in Aberdeen or Tim on your screen. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, Prof. Oliver, for Corneli, for these very nice lectures. And uh, I am Ahmad Modi. Uh, I moderated with you. I'd like to thank you. Thank I you. just can, uh, yes, uh, with a very essential and uh, important topic with COVID. Actually, the mycoma causes it was like a nightmare for the most of the uh, cancers the last few months. So uh, let me check if you have any questions in the uh, chat room. And uh, just give me a second, a second, I would see. So I cannot see any more questions or uh, queries either in the QA or in the chat room. So uh, uh, thank you again, Prof. Oliver Cornelly, for this very nice lecture. And uh, inshallah, I hope next conference will be on site, will be physical. Oh, yes. Rather, yes. <laughs> I would really love to return to the region. I, I haven't been there for so long. That's, uh, yeah. that's I miss it. The hospitality. Uh, <laughs> yes, really, we, 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 we feel different, actually. In virtual, we still feel the far, and we don't feel the, uh, as, you said, as you said, the friendly environments during the uh, on-site conference. Inshallah soon. I think currently the, 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 mycor, the mycosis uh, the conference we just highlight now in Scotland, it will be on-site, or it will be, physical, it will be virtual also. Uh, it'll be a hybrid, so you can do both. Hybrid. Yeah, we have uh, 600 uh, attendees, and currently it's 50% will actually really be there, and 50% will be remote. Yeah. Okay, great. So hope it's, to see you soon. Yeah, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I'd like to thank all attendees uh, who stayed with us until this last day, last hours of this night. And by the end of this uh, very uh, eminent session and eminent speaker, I'd like to close the uh, track P of the second day of the uh, infections in ICU uh, entrance vestibule perspective. And uh, I'd like to thank all the organizing and the scientific committee, as well as, of course, the uh, Saudi Critical Care Society for organizing and hosting these types of the conference, which all of us in need for this one. Uh, my great thanks for all sponsored companies. Uh, thank you so much for your being with us. Again, see you, inshallah, Prof. Oliver. Thank you so much. See you.